but you need to be a bit closer to the microphone. And yes, what science is? Tell us. Ah, well, that's a big subject. So science today, different than science was, but science is, I would say, one of the best ways to learn empirical things about the world, to gather knowledge about the world, to understand it, to grasp parts of it. Now, it's not the only way to know about the world. There are many other ways. And in fact, I think human beings have had many systems of organizing and gathering knowledge over history, over the history of the species on the planet. So there's religion and philosophy, uh, law, economics, politics, all of these things are also systems for gathering knowledge and thinking about how to act in the world. I would say science is interestingly the newest of them. So there are many antecedents to science and many other places it came about and China and Egypt and Greece and Babylonia. Um, but modern science, as we know it today, this global enterprise really began, I would say, in 1600 in Western Europe with people like Copernicus and Francis Bacon. And then it spread around the world. And I think it's a, it's a particularly different kind of science than we've ever had before. What is the good things that we can do with science now? And what is the bad things? Uh, well, there's always good things and bad things you can do with anything, right? Nothing is perfectly good, um, and that's the way science is. I mean, we all hate the bomb, but we love anesthesia, so, you know. <laughs> you love anesthesia. Well, if you're having a surgery, you certainly <laughs> oh, do, <yeah>. right? So, um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think. So, um, so that's always the case. I mean, things can be put to good use or bad use. I mean, I think nuclear energy will one day solve much of our energy problem, um, but it also has dangers that go with it and risks. I don't, I mean, science is not value free, we say. It's not, doesn't, it, What you do know. you mean value free? Well, value free, I mean, there, you know, it, it has some moral side to it. Yes, that's true. But I think the pure act of doing science does not have, um, does not contain within it good or bad. It's the use people put to it. I mean, you know, if you overeat and get fat, you can't blame the farmer for that, right? I mean, the farmer just produces the food. I think scientists just kind of try and produce knowledge, try and produce understanding, try and help us grasp certain kinds of things in the world. Um, and then how they get used, well, I, I, you know, that's up to other people and what other people will do and how we feel as a as a species you know so science uh, I, in my well, in my experience science was something like not for me science it was something that uh, clever people do and like <laughs> yeah. with your ted talk it was like oh my god science is actually something that I can't understand. <laughs> well, I hope that, that's a thrilling thing to hear from me. I mean, I really appreciate that. That's the idea because science is one of the great adventures that human beings have ever gone on. I mean, you know, in 400 years, the planet has changed, maybe for better, maybe for worse a little bit, that's true, but it has changed in ways we could never have imagined. I mean, it's almost as if another species has arrived on the planet 400 years ago. Ideas of progress, I, Progress is part of science, but in progress, there's a lot of people who say many things about progress. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, again. But, but the idea of progress is something completely new. I mean, 500 years ago, people didn't think things were going to change. You did what your parents did, and your children would do what you did, you know? The records in, in around the Mediterranean, medieval Europe and all that, although people traveled a bit, most people never went more than five miles from the place they were born, unless they were conscripted in the army and sent off to fight a battle somewhere, you know. <laughs> um, so, so people just went along generation after generation in the same technology. Somebody could be born, grow up and die and the technology would not have changed at all. Can you imagine that today? I mean, you know, we expect a new iPhone every a year, and don't science we? science did all this that we see. Well, I think it did a lot of it. And, and more importantly, I think, is not so much what it's done, but it's allowed us to think about progress as if it's, we expect it. It's given us the idea of progress as a common idea. We just expect a new iPhone every other year or so, right? We expect that things can get better. Uh, we believe things can improve. And that's something that I think 
even just a few generations ago, people would never have thought was possible. They just, well, it's the world, it's what it is, you make the best of it, and let's hope for the best. I mean, there were little bits of progress, there were little things, but nothing that you could tell in a single lifetime, you know, that would give you that. So feeling. let's say one person is a bit afraid of science, doesn't yeah. understand, like, what is some steps you think an, a person can take easy ste baby steps through science to understand this world so it, it's not so hard it, not as hard as people think i mean it, it's a problem the way we teach science yeah you, exactly what you said we teach science as if it's some kind of um you know historical uh hero narrative that it's one genius to another right from newton to kepler to galileo i have the order wrong there but you know and the maxwell and einstein and kaboom there's physics and it just seems like it, you have to be a genius to do science. This is not the case. This is just not the case. We don't talk about all the failures that those people had. Galileo failed most of the time. Newton wrote, Newton wrote more papers on alchemy than he did on physics. Alchemy. I mean, that's not science even, but he thought it was. What alchemy is? Alchemy is the idea of being able to turn lead into gold the transmutation of substances. Okay. It was a precursor of chemistry, but there's no basis for it. It is, alchemy is to chemistry like astrology is to astronomy, right? There's, you know, people may believe in it still, but there's no scientific basis for it, uh, I okay. would say, right? So, but Newton spent a lot of time doing alchemical experiments. Useless, useless. We don't hear about that today, but it's, it's the case. And so... I think one of the things that's important for people to realize is that most of what scientists do is fail. <laughs> we ask questions and then we, we fail at trying to get the answer most of the time, but a few times we succeed. And that's very important. Failure is a crucial part of science to me. Um, for one, science is not infallible. You know who's infallible. <laughs> That's a Who? different thing. Who is the Pope is infallible, oh, right? Or, you know, <laughs> or certain other figures that people believe absolutely infallible, the word of this or that, but science has no such thing. We fail regularly, and that proves for us that science is a valid way to gain knowledge because it doesn't come from authority. I have a, a quote that I love from Francis Bacon, who you could consider the father of modern science, maybe, if you want. And you But, said in one of your talks that we need to pay more attention, give more value to the people that are dead. Yes, well, <laughs> well, at least, I don't know about more value, but they shouldn't be left out of the conversation just because they're dead, if they had something useful to say, right? Okay, say the quote. So Francis Bacon says, um, previously, truth came from authority, meaning the Pope or the church at least, or the state or, or you know, the government or, or whatever, or Aristotle, whoever, some big figure. So previously truth came from authority, but from now on authority will come from truth. That's a big difference, right? That's an amazing thing to say, to think even, right? That now if you know something, that gives you authority. Not I have That's authority. In the, yeah, 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 it's yeah, amazing, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So to me, this is the difference. This is why science can fail because eventually it will gain the authority. You, you know that, it, that it's worthy of listening to because when it succeeds, it went through a lot of failure to get there. It doesn't succeed every time. Can you tell me why ig you are in love with ignorance? Yeah, sure. Please. <laughs> I, um, you know, I've become famous for ignorance, unfortunately, but <laughs> what can you do? Unfortunately. Yeah, well, unfortunately. Um, I, I, the first thing, of course, is that I use the word ignorance to be intentionally provocative a little bit, right? I don't mean stupidity. I don't mean uh, careless indifference. Well, I like the word stupidity as well. So. Well, there is some, no, there is some value to stupidity. You're right. <laughs> But a kind of intentional stupidity or lazy stupidity is not a good idea, right? Recognizing stupidity is good. I mean, yes, I, I think I, I'm pretty stupid about a lot of things, and therefore I should either keep my mouth shut or learn about them one or the other, but don't pretend to know. So that's exactly right. You're, you're completely right there. But I mean lazy stupidity or an indifference to fact or things like that, you know. Uh, what I mean by ignorance is the sum total of what we don't know as a species about the world, about the universe, about ourselves. 
And, and this is what science is about. It's not about a pile of facts in a textbook, which is what you're commonly think of when you go to school, because yes. that's what they give you. Fuck school. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm of two minds about that, to be honest with you. I'm so, curious to see you. Okay, so a lot of people will, I mean, it's easy to criticize school and education and say, you know, in school we take creative young people and we educate them for 12 years and turn them into boring adults. And that's true, that happens. I think most creative young people can turn into boring adults without school too. It just, it happens if you're not careful. So I don't think school is the worst thing in the world. I'm, in the end, it's better you go to school than not go to school. I think there's a better way to go to school, but I wouldn't say we should just blame everything on school and, and say it's a terrible thing, it's a mess, you know, it doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, school, you mean, you in, you s- is the same with university, you say? Even or? university, it can be any level. I mean, whatever level you feel comfortable at achieving at is, is fine. I don't think university is the best thing in the world, certainly not for everybody. It's a nice thing if, if it's what you want to do, but for many people, being out in the world is better. You know, I... I don't know whether you know this about me or not even, but you know, before I got into science, I worked in the theater for many years. Yes. I was a director and a little bit of an actor, not much, but I did lighting design and mostly directing. I had no college for that. I did not go to college to learn theater because you don't learn about the theater in college. You go out and you become an apprentice. You work with people whose work you think is good and important or this or that 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 you like, and you learn from them. You learn by doing. I think that's a very, very good way of learning. Better than college for many things. Now, when I wanted to be to change careers, it's a long story why, it's not so important, but I got interested in science. And At I thought 30, I would, right? I was about 30 years old, so I'd never been to college. And I thought, well, I'll try a college course and see what happens. And I, I found I liked it. So I continued what on with What did you it. like about this? Well, I was a bit amazed. I, I was interested in animal behavior. That was the science part I was interested in. And really... I was interested in that because I had some idea about doing a theater piece about human and animal relationships. That was what I wanted to do. So I thought I'll go take a class in animal behavior at the local university. This was uh, San Francisco State University. Small college kind of place, you know. And I went and took a class from a man named Hal Markowitz. I mentioned his name because he was a wonderful mentor for me, which I think is very important in a person's life. Um, He passed away a few years ago, I'm sorry to say, but he was a biology professor there. He worked in animal behavior. And I took this class from him. There were 20 students, I guess, in the class. And I thought, this is amazing. I sit here and he stands up there and he tells me everything he knows about animal behavior. And I thought, well, this is a cool idea, right? (laughs) This is great. Who who thought of this anyway? I mean, I think actually Aristotle thought of it or somebody like that or Confucius, I don't know. But... You know, I was just catching up. So I was entranced with this idea that, you know, somebody was willing to share so much um, of what they knew in, in, in what I thought was quite a generous way. I mean, yeah, he was paid for it. It was his job. But nonetheless, he could have done a crappy job of it. And instead, he really went out of his way. So and he convinced me over the years to take more courses and eventually take a degree in biology, which I did. And then I got this degree in biology, and then really is the first time I made a real choice because it was either go back and work in the theater with your degree in biology or go to graduate school. I was 34 years old then, which was old for graduate school then, not so much now, but it was then. And um, I thought I'll apply to graduate schools and see what happens. If I get in, I'll go. If I don't get in, I'm happy. I got a degree. I'll go back and work in the theater. I was very successful Successful enough, anyway. Um, what success means? Uh, what, what What do you mean successful? What point you got in the theater? Oh well, I to... so the theater for me was I I. And theater, you mean like people acting? Yeah, not, yeah, not, live theater, not uh, because not cinema, not, not movies, film, not, not TV or film. I worked a little bit in television and film. I I just wasn't any good at it. It's not that I don't like TV and film. I go to the movies. I watch television. I'm not a snob or anything like that. I love it a great deal. But I was not very good at it. I was good at live theater. I needed to have actors to work with and, you know, not... Film and TV are too scripted, you know. Uh, You have to have everything at the right angle and in the right place, and you get to redo it all the time. I didn't like that. (laughs) I just didn't like that process as much. I wasn't as, for my feeling, not as creative. 
So that was another good reason to leave the theater because it's very hard to make a living just in the theater without doing film and TV. So I knew I would have to do film and TV. But anyway, I decided to apply for graduate schools and see what happened. Then I got in, luckily, to Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, a very good school. I'm fond of saying I think is the result of a clerical error. Somebody made a mistake and said, let him in. But I went and I, I met yet another great mentor there, a man named Frank Werblin, with whom I'm still very close friends. And he helped me a great deal through graduate school, which was like an apprenticeship. Graduate school, they call it school, but it's not really school. You really do you work in a laboratory. And then I, uh, after that, I wound up doing what's called a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University with a man named Gordon Shepard, who, another great mentor, who I'm sorry to say just passed away this summer, so now I've lost two of three. It's beginning to worry me. <laughs> I have to say, things are catching up, you know, but that's yeah. how it goes. So, um, and he was also a great mentor, and then finally I wound up with a, uh, a position here at so, Columbia, which I'm, is I'm great. Cu I'm curious to... So I found in my life that when I have, for example, a different background and I jump into a new thing, I'm stronger in that new thing. Like uh, you said, you had a theater background. And yeah. So how did that help you to your academic career? Maybe it helped to the TED talk that you gave a bit. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it, it did help in many ways that way. I mean, uh, although people don't think this, but in science, one of the things that's most important is your ability to present the work. So yeah, you work in the laboratory and you do experiments and you have to think about what the experiments are and how you'll do them. But in the end, if all you have is a bunch of books full of data and you can't tell anybody about it, what good is that? And so I think the ability to communicate the science is crucial, especially in our modern culture. Not only communicate it to other scientists, and that's important, but to communicate it to the public, to people who are not necessarily experts in your field, but to give them an appreciation for it if they care about it. They may or may not, you know, but that's their choice. At least it's available to them. And I think that's crucial because science has a very important role to play in society, but if it stays locked up in the laboratory, it's a lost cause. So you are uh, interested in smell. So yeah. all your life, no, your academic life, yeah. you are, you are, the topic that you are focused on is smelling, right? Yes. So can <laughs> I know you... know that sounds kind of weird, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> why would somebody spend their whole life on that? <laughs> yeah, tell me why. Why? Well... Isn't it boring? What did you learn? What, what lessons can we take from what your life's okay. work? Okay, so it was a bit of an accident that I got into the field of smell, not entirely. Um, I, I was interested, as I said before, I was originally interested in animal behavior. But when I got into graduate school, it was at a period of time when there was a great deal of advances in molecular biology and cell biology and things like that, and much less at the level of animal behavior. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to go into neuroscience, which is, you know, part behavior, our brain is what governs our behavior, I should maybe do something a little bit more, we say reductionist, more cellular or molecular, something like that. So I, I thought, didn't understand what, uh, yeah, so what reductionist means. Reductionist means instead of working on the big thing, you work on some small little okay. piece of it. You try, and, you try and pull it apart into the smaller parts in the hope that yeah, if you yeah. understand the parts, you can put them back together again and make the whole. It rarely works that way, in fact, <laughs> but that's the idea, okay? <laughs> so I thought, well, what can I do in animal behavior that is nonetheless still at this level of, you know, biochemistry or... Um, uh, physiology, things like that, and not just straight behavior. And I thought, well, the sense of smell is really important to the behavior of many animals, as it turns out also to us, but we don't think so. But in most other animals, the sense of smell is maybe their primary sense and governs a great deal of their behavior. As we say in the, in, in the world of behavior, there are the four Fs of behavior. So feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating right, this is the, the other one. And so all of those in animals are governed by smell, you know, finding a mate, finding food, avoiding a predator. And so I thought, well, maybe I should look at the olfactory system, the sense of smell and see what people know. And it turned out, because we're very visual animals, most people prefer to work in vision or hearing. 
And there was little, not little, but not much known about smell, not as much. It was not as sophisticated a field as vision or hearing and not so many people in it. So there were a lot of big questions in olfaction, a lot of things unanswered. And I thought, I like that. I like big questions. I like a place where we don't know very much yet. Um, and so that was a, a, so a like choice business, for me. So like business, you found a market under the underserved. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. And you look for that in science as well. You know, what is not investigated enough? What, what are people not paying attention to enough? And so for me, it was smell. And that worked out very well, I have to say. I mean, it's well, been very... Well, teach me some stuff about smell. Like, what is interesting oh, well, about this? We could go through too many things here. I don't know what to, what to say about it. <laughs> I'll, all right, I'll tell you what I think would be maybe most interesting to know about smell because it's the most... Um, it's, it's the most, uh, what can I say, wrong idea that most people have about smell, which is that we have a very good sense of smell. So people think we don't have as good a sense of smell as, say, dogs or something like that. This is not true. We are quite good at smell. The biggest problem with our sense of smell is that we walk on two legs. And all of the good odors, they're, they're molecules, and they have some weight to them, actually, and they tend to be along the ground, maybe a, you know, a couple of inches, 10 and 12 inches off the ground. So you see when a dog gets a scent, its nose goes right to the ground, right? Because that's where it's strongest. But we have our noses stuck up here at five feet, six feet in the air. Interesting. We don't get many of these smells. If you and I got off our seats now and sniffed around on the floor, you would be shocked at what you smell. I, I, so, I suppose you did that a lot, right? Yeah. I, I don't do it lately, but I have done it before. So, and I try and get students to do it, but they don't always do it. Um, you know, I always say about dogs, you think they have a great sense of smell, right? But if you had a great sense of smell, would you do that greeting thing that they do where they stick their nose right up the other ones behind? You know, you think a good sense of smell would be I can do that from two feet away, not that I have to put mm -hmm. my nose right in your okay. behind, right? You know, so, but I think that's the difference. So for dogs, smell is more important than it is for people and they get more information from it. So they put their nose where the odors are. We met today, we shook hands, very nice. It would have been more informative to smell each other's armpits, but we don't do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I love this. <laughs> so, and I'm not suggesting we should, but there would be much more information there. The place where our sense of smell does work very well for us is in flavor. So not taste. Taste is only five things. Sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and savory or umami because we learned about it from Asian cuisine. So it's the taste of savory. It's the taste of meat or things like that. So those are the five things that, that you taste. Everything else is really flavor. So fruit flavors, the flavor of a banana or a pear, um, the flavor of, I don't know, watermelon, doesn't matter, any, any of those things, vegetables, any of those flavors, that, that's mostly smell. That's about 80% of that is smell. And the way that works in humans, and it's only in humans, when, when our, you know, most animals have a long nose and big face, even chimpanzees have a much bigger snout than us. When our faces over evolutionary time became flatter, one of the other things that happened was a pathway in the back of our mouth opened up between, between here and your nose. We call this, I'm sorry for the name, but we call this the retronasal pathway. He's Triple drinking water. water, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the retronasal pathway. And what happens is when you put food in your mouth and you chew it, ideally with your mouth closed for good manners, right? You chew it, you mash up the food, you release all the molecules, and you put a lot of pressure on it as well, and it blows it up the back of your mouth right onto your nose. And that's where you perceive the flavor. Now, you feel like it's in so your you mouth, but it's not. smell the flavor. Yes. So you can do a simple experiment if you want. You know, when you have a cold, food doesn't taste very good, right? People during COVID lost their sense of smell and said, I also lost my sense of taste. That's not true. They lost their sense of flavor. If you took somebody during COVID who lost their sense of smell and you put sugar or salt on their tongue, they would taste it just fine. But they couldn't sense flavor. So food didn't quote, taste like anything. But there's that important distinction. And we're very good at flavor. 
you could say that humans have the most discriminating palate of any animal. I mean, your dogs will eat damn near anything, right? I mean, anything they find on the street, they just gobble it up. But we don't. We're very careful about what we eat, and we have great cuisines in the world. We have chefs, all of these sorts of things. And that's all because of our sense of smell. So what about uh, the when we like someone and like all these perfumes that we use and all this stuff, like do they play a big role? Because I... I I don't like to wear perfumes because I, it's like confusing the other person what who <laughs> you really are. Is that true? Well, you could uh, confuse somebody about that, I suppose. I, I mean, listen, I think perfumes and fragrances, if you enjoy that, they're, they're pleasant enough. I don't think there's anything in a perfume or a fragrance that would make me fall in love with you just like that, you know? But it, it uh, helps. It doesn't help. It helps. I'll tell you what I think the real role of olfaction in personal things is negative, actually. So you can meet somebody who you find very attractive physically. Then you talk with them and they're very engaging and a nice conversation and everything. And then you finally get up close to them for a kiss and they have some funny odor. It's over. You'll never get past that. You might as well kiss them goodbye because that's it. You're finished. So what do you mean by funny over? Like well, you know, they smell from something that just doesn't attract you. They have a, a funny body odor. And we all have different chemistry. And we do smell different. Um, I'm always amazed. My, we have, uh, you know, our laboratories, we have students from all over the world. So they eat different things. And they're used to different smells. So, for example, our... Um, Uh, Indian people have a specific smell. A specific smell because of the curry, right? Um, Chinese. I, we have a couple of Chinese kids in the laboratory, and they think I smell like butter. You. Yeah. <laughs> White people in general, Caucasians, smell like butter because we eat a lot of dairy, and they don't. And so they're very sensitive to it. You know, I think they have a slight garlic smell about them because they use a lot of garlic in the food that we don't. So, so I think people smell differently, and sometimes that's attractive, and sometimes it's not. We don't really know why you find one thing. It could be the way you were raised, some smell that you smelled when you were a kid that was, you know, associated with a punishment or something. We don't know. But in general, I would say you can't, if somebody has an off smell to you, then you can't get past that. So in, in many ways, it's more of a negative than a positive to, to people. So that's, and sometimes you can confuse if you have a bad smell with a perfume as well. So Yes, yeah, so you could cover it with a perfume and then <laughs> eventually, but eventually people find out. <laughs> but if it's like in the third time that they met you, that they find out. It's a little the, trickier, I yeah. agree. <laughs> I agree. So yes, I think you're right about perfume in a sense of not disguising anything about yourself. But on the other hand, I don't know, you know, people find them pleasant. It's amazing how much money we spend every year. I know this because I work a little bit with the fragrance industry, right? Oh, you help them? Uh, I don't help them do too much. I mostly as a consultant that I work with one of them. So all of the fragrances and flavors in the world are made by three or four companies that you've never heard of. And then they sell them to the bigger companies that make products and put a few drops of each thing in their product, right? So everything from dish soap that you want to smell like lemons or something like that to, you know, toothpaste and perfumes or aftershave lotion or soaps or whatever it is. They and use it in all the products, actually. If you go home tonight and you look in your cabinet, right, or in your cupboards or whatever, and you take everything out and you look at the ingredients, everything, everything will have an added fragrance or flavor. Even things that are, quote, fragrance-free. Because nothing is fragrance-free. So you buy some soap that says fragrance-free. They had to put something in there to cover the fragrance that soap naturally has, right? So... Nothing is not without some fragrance in general. And is that like people use it, you think, a lot? They the world understand how important this is and they use it to make more money, you think? Well, I can tell you these are very profitable companies. So I don't have the latest statistics, but I remember I looked this up some years ago. Now, I think it must be at least 10 or 12 years ago. And the statistic was that, that in America, people spent over, what was it, over $8 billion dollars a year on products just designed to change their own personal smell. So toothpaste, uh, shaving cream, soap, perfumes, things like that. Anything that would change. So this doesn't even How include much? Eight? like $8 billion. Dollars. And this was 10 or 12 years ago. 
So probably now it's 10x, 20x. Uh, at least best. something like that, right? And that doesn't even include the things that are made to make your, you know, your towel smell like lemons or your bathroom to be improbably like a pine forest or something like that, you know. So that's even more. So we use it a lot. I think we do a lot of it as unconscious. We but just feel yes, better yes, around yes, certain yes. smells. I, I think you know? there is no like, you never speak, oh, this is uh, like, you might say, oh, this has great smell, but it's not a conversation that you have. No. <laughs> oh, no. I bought and this and it, uh, it smelled amazing and that's why I'm buying it. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it's more subconscious stuff. Yes, it's, it's, it's just, but, but it's an important subconscious thing because we know when people lose their sense of smell, they complain bitterly about it. I mean, they really feel that the world is not the same place to them without the sense of smell. During COVID, this became very clear. There were people who would say, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I come home, especially people with longer lasting loss of sense of smell. They would say, I come home and I know it's my house. I know the number on the door. I see the furniture. I don't feel like I'm at home because the smell of their house that they never paid any attention to is missing. And so there's a kind of, we say, embodiment, a certain layer of a sense of sensibility about a room, a place. When the smell is gone, it's very serious. Also, people who lose their sense of smell become a little paranoid. They worry that they won't smell a fire or a gas leak. So we don't think of it ever, but this early warning system is always vigilant. It's always out there checking the environment, right? But we don't think about it because it's just in the background. But when you lose it, you think about it, you know. So how can we use this? Like, this is this is why I'm so fascinated with science, because you can because I'm, I'm more like a business, whatever person. Yeah. And like you can get something from science that they discover and then you can start a business you and like make millions <laughs> because of uh, the because science kind of tells you what's closest to the truth. So what's some stuff? Uh, you you found out that people can use in their business. Yeah, well, I haven't made a million yet or anything like that, but I mean, <laughs> nothing that I've, that I've done. In terms of, so sometimes it works out and it turns into a product and sometimes it doesn't. As I said, the fragrance industry is mostly these three big companies. They're global companies and they're, they all have revenue streams of about five or six billion dollars a year just providing... This, this stuff to companies like Procter & Gamble or Unilever or whoever. But what do you do right? every day? I'm, I'm like a bit confused. Like you, what do you test in the laboratory? Oh, like, what do I, it's, like a bit. It's, it's funny. I, I always get this kind of question from people, you know, like my uh, uh, people, you go out to dinner with them and it's a bunch of bankers maybe or financiers or this or that or lawyers, even whatever. And I'm the only scientist at the table. And eventually I always get the question, so... So what do you actually like do during the day? <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, we know what lawyers do, we know what accountants do, we know what doctors do, but somehow or another nobody has any real idea what a scientist does all day long. I the nice thing about being a scientist is you do a lot of things. So sometimes you're reading, sometimes you're writing, sometimes you're thinking of experiments. Uh, if you're younger, you're doing the experiments which means you're, you know, sometimes mixing chemicals, you're um, culturing cells, we call it. You're making, keeping cells alive and doing, looking to see if they react to this or that or in what way they react to it. You make a lot of measurements. So you, you have like an assumption from before, uh, oh, I think if I do this, then this will happen or, and that will tell us this information. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the straightforward way of doing it. It rarely happens that way. Usually it's some accident that, that, that occurs, some result you but didn't you expect. But you learn from that thing, and so you do the next thing. Yes. So it's kind of trial and error. Yes, a little to, bit of trial and error. I mean, it's, it's not just accidental trial and error. It's, you know, you try and think your way through it. But there's a famous quote from Isaac Asimov, the science writer and science fiction writer, who, who said, you know, when a scientist looks at new data from their laboratory, they don't say Eureka. That's not what they want to say. What they want to look at and say is, oh, that's strange, because that means there's some big puzzle here. There's something really interesting here. Just saying, oh, it worked. Ugh, so what? Okay, it worked. We thought it would work. But it's more interesting in a way if it doesn't work and we get to go deeper into the, into the issue, right? 
So, so you get excited when you... When things don't work, yeah. <laughs> I actually prefer it when they don't. The students aren't as happy about that. They would prefer everything worked and they get their thesis degree and their papers and all. But I like it when things don't work. I think you learn more. You find more out about things. So this is a, a, a big question that I had reading your book. Is it better to fail or is it better to succeed? Well... Because I'm confused because <laughs> I upload the video and like if it gets 7 million views, I get a lot of information yeah. from that. But if it gets whatever, 500,000 views, I get a lot of information yeah. from that as well. But like, I'm, which one is better? <laughs> well, I don't know that. I, I think they both come into play. I don't see ignorance and failure or I don't see failure and success, I should say, as two sides of the same coin. I think they're more like two horses pulling the wagon in the same direction. You use them both. And you can get as much from failure as you can from success. I like to say if, if we think that ignorance is important, ignorance the way I mean it, which is something we don't know. We don't know something we want to find out. So if that's important, then the deepest kind of ignorance, the really deep ignorance is what you don't know, you don't know, right? Here's the stuff I don't even know, I don't know. The unknown, unknown as they call and it. And how do right? you find out about the... Uh you fail. The only way I know to find out about that is by failing. Here's something I don't know, and I have this idea for an experiment. So I'm going to do the experiment. Now the experiment fails. So I go, well, there must be something I don't know that I don't know that was caused that experiment to fail. So what could that be? Then you have to go back and think more about it. And it gives you it, a right? hint of what Yes, is... what it could be. So maybe I should change these few things here. I'll try that. That didn't work. I'll try these other things here. I, something I have to change in the beginning. So it gives you, a, I think, a, you know, a chance to go deeper into a question. So that's why failure is valuable. One reason. There are several reasons, but that's one reason it's valuable. The other is it makes things more fun. I mean, look at what we do in sports, right? We, we, we work out rules for sports so that failure happens most of the time. I mean, look, here's this ball, and all you have to do is get it into that big net at the end of the thing there. That's simple. Oh, but you can't use your hands. Well, this makes the greatest game in the world, right? Football. So yes. because we purposely make it so that most of the time you fail, right? How many goals do you score in a game of football? Interesting. One or two. Most of the time it's a failure, right? And that makes the game more interesting because you're always yes. on the edge of your seat. Because one success could be the difference, right? Yes. And it can make, uh, if you know that trick, it makes when things are very, very difficult, it's a lot more rewarding, a lot when it more. When it succeeds, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. I, because I, I've been in Navy SEAL training. I finished Navy ah. SEAL uh, school in my country, Cyprus. And because the success rate is like, we entered like 200 people and, and only, only 13 couple. people finished. So like, it's so That's valuable. That's a big deal, it's right? It's so interesting yes. Yes. because of this reason. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you need failure to be able to depend on success. I mean, if everybody succeeded, what good would that be? How would so you tell you, them one you apart from the other? You can use that actually to, and that's why like Harvard is or Columbia is like is a lot of people want to get in, but few people get yes, in, and yes. like, that makes it like a lot more valuable and a lot more interesting. Yeah, I mean, there are many people who would disagree with you about some of that. So it's not a simple. It should be, but it's not that simple. But yes, there's no question that. People apply to Columbia. They've already a little bit self-selected because they're already the best people in their high school class or this or that. So we get very good people applying, but we get far more than we can accept. And so maybe they take six or eight percent of the people that apply. So in theory, yes, we're we're selecting the best of the best. Doesn't always work out that way. There are all sorts of other reasons that happen and interfere with that. But that would be the idea, yes. And so that's one way to ensure success, yes. So you end your TED talk with, let's get the matches. Ah, uh, yes, okay. So because you <laughs> think that it's better to uh, to light fire, light the yeah. speed, whatever. Uh, light a fire, light than fill a bucket. To, pe to people of life. Yes. Of learn How do you light up fires in people to your students? Well, I think you do that by leaving them with more questions than answers. If you leave people with a question, with a puzzle, then you've engaged their mind. You've, I think, lit the fire of, you know, I need to know this. I'd like to know this. If all you do is teach them what's in the textbook and a pile of facts and say, okay, now you're done. Well, that's the other side of it. I mean, 
I, I borrow this phrase from, from William Butler Yeats, the poet who said, the purpose of education is not to fill buckets, but to, to light fires, right? And so we can fill a bucket by just giving you lots and lots of facts and you spit them back on a test. I call it the bulimic model of education, right? We shove a lot of crap down your throat and then you throw it up on the exam and you move on with no appreciable gain of anything. Or we can try and leave people with the idea that there's so much to be known, there's, there's a place for you here. I mean, I think that's very important in science education especially. I think we give people the idea that we pretty much know it all, so what's the purpose of you being a scientist? I mean, you know, I make a joke about the textbook that I use in our neuroscience course. It's a very famous textbook, Principles of Neuroscience. But it's a big book. I have it over on the shelf there. It weighs, according to Amazon's shipping weight, it weighs seven and a half pounds. That's twice the weight of a human brain. <laughs> it's a book about the brain. <laughs> I mean, that's too much stuff, right? And we don't really know much. We don't. What we know about the brain, you could fit in a little, you know. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you about how do you actually put the questions in the students. But now that you said about a big book, uh, one thing that you said in your book that I found interesting, you said, I'm sorry that I, my, the book is not shorter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, I, I, I didn't have the time. This is a, yeah. fam this is a famous phrase. Yeah, but from, you uh, said, not that I didn't have the time because I'm stupid. Is something like this. You said. Yeah, I don't remember what I said in the book about it. But it, <laughs> but it comes from the idea that, um, that it, uh, oh, no, I've forgotten the person who did it. He's a very famous writer, um, old, older writer. Uh, somebody like Balzac. I can't remember. It'll come to me in a moment. I <laughs> These things happen now. Um, but he wrote a long letter to a friend. And at the end of the letter, he said, famously, he said, I apologize for the length of this letter. I would have been briefer if I'd had more time. Because it takes more time and more thought to write concisely than it does to just spill your guts out and put everything you've ever thought into a book. I feel that way about the book. I, I think, I, you know, I, it was always my purpose to write as short a book as possible because... So when you write a book, people always say, one of the questions you always get at a cocktail party is, so who do you think your audience is? I'm sure you get this. Who's your audience for this yes. podcast, right? Who do you think you're trying to communicate with? I never knew what to answer. And then one day I actually came up with an answer that I liked. I think I like, I'd like to think that I write books for busy people because I want busy people who get things done to read my books. But if they're busy, they don't have time to read 500 pages of my bullshit, right? Maybe they have time to read 100 pages of it. Wow, beautiful. <laughs> you know? And so I think if it's a small book, they'll go, okay, I, I'll try this and see. And if all they have to do is spend a couple hours reading it and they get a few good ideas from it, I'm thrilled, right? So what you're saying is very interesting because like when I come up with the script of the introduction of my video, I, I, I write it 25 times because I try to consent, yes, yeah. put the, all the information shorter and shorter because I know if it's long, people will not yeah, watch. <laughs> by, by facts, I see whenever I see that, when I see oh, when, when people the, leave, yeah. and it's like when I have longer introduction, then people leave. So I'm trying to put all the information yeah, yeah. that I need to communicate. But it's well, 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 maybe we should stop this conversation now because people are leaving. Right? No, they are not leaving because we did a good job on the introduction. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so it's it's very important to try to be as precise as possible. I think so. Yes, I think so. Um, Even in daily life, when we're relaxed and sit. Uh, Yes, I, you know, there's a, I, I hate to keep using quotes, but they're good quotes, so why not? The, um, the, um, right, the, the uh, poet and, um, wait, I'm going to, now I've lost his name too, because I'm thinking of somebody else. Um, oh, what was his name? He's also, a, you're going to edit this, right? <laughs> no, we're not going to edit this. Oh, you better edit some of this. Um, <laughs> was it not Gore Vidal? Um, oh, my God. I can't believe I've lost his name. Anyway, he's a very famous poet, and he said, and also a scientist. He was a well-known, what's called a lepidopterist. This is somebody who studies butterflies. And he wrote several papers on butterflies. And he once said that the key to success, the key to success is to have the imagination of a scientist and the precision of a poet. 
You would think it would be the opposite, but he's right. It's the imagination of a scientist because we imagine all kinds of crazy things, but the precision of a poet because a poet says things in the fewest possible words with the most emphasis, right? The so most the people, I heard it a lot of times, the people that they speak less, they are usually more clever. <laughs> or that's Well, what do they say? You can, you can let people think you're stupid or you can open your mouth and prove it, right? <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> so, so how do, uh, do you like, how do you raise the questions in people? In your students? Well, I, I mean... I Because that's yeah. the good question. Well, yeah, how, do you, yeah. how do you do that? <laughs> yes, the good, the, we have to raise people's questions, yeah, yeah. but the, how do you do it? <laughs> it it's for, I will I admit, it's very difficult to do, especially you know in a standard science class. And it's especially to, hard to do at the level that I work, the undergraduate level, because many of these students want to go on to graduate school or medical school or law school, whatever it is they want, and they need to get, you know... They need to get a good grade, and they also need a certain amount of knowledge. I mean, you can't be a scientist with only questions. You have to have some facts. Why? No, you need to know some things, right? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, you need to know some things to be anything. If you But want to if be you a lawyer, you need to know things. If you have questions and you are yeah. raising the other question, like... To raise the other question, you need some understanding. So it's like, it well, will like, happen naturally if you have more questions. So. Well, you just said so it, though. We no, only focus on questions. Why not? No, 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 wait. But you just said it. Under, to, to, to ask a good question, you have to have some understanding, right? So the question can't just be, oh, I wonder about my toenails or something. Why not? Out of, well, I mean, you could if that's <laughs> what you want to do. But if you want to ask a sophisticated, a good question, then, I mean, I always say that, The purpose of knowledge, the purpose of gaining knowledge is to ask a better question. So you always want to ask better and better questions. That's the purpose of knowing something. What, what, can you tell me what is a good question? No. You never know a good question until you hear it. There are many, many ways that are good questions. I think a good question, well... A good question is one that... Um, This is the best moment of my life. I'm asking you what <laughs> a good question is. And I'm telling you I don't know. Because, <laughs> you know, ignorance is what we're talking about. Um, it, it's, all, it's hard to know sometimes what a good question is. Sometimes you think you have a really good question, and then it turns out to be not so interesting a question. Either the answer is trivial, you didn't think it would be, but it turns out to be sort of trivial, or... It doesn't lead anywhere. I think a good question gives you an answer that gives you a better question. So sometimes you don't know what the good question was until you've gone through the process. So you can judge how good of a question uh, you asked of the, the, how good the question you have after. Yes. So that yes. will be a good meter to, to yes. ask. Yes. I would say a question that turns into a better question is a good question. And then that continues on down the line wow. because there's no end to the possible questions. Right. And so, you know, th that's what you want. So you don't, uh, uh, again, we, I think we tend to believe that, you know, you start out with some ignorance or something you don't know, and then you learn something and you gain knowledge. But then I think a bigger question is what do you do with that knowledge? I mean, you just put it in the bank. No, you ask a better question. You use it to frame a more sophisticated question, a deeper question. When did you understand in your life that questions are very important? Because I, I think I understood like two years ago that probably questions is the most important thing mm. in life. Yeah, and some people never get to that place, I'm afraid, because we don't, well, we don't train them that way. We don't, you know, we don't reward people typically that way, or, we don't, or, or the reward for a good question is not as immediate as the reward for, say, a solution or a, you know, a new gadget or something like that. But of course, that only came from having asked a good question. So uh, I, th I think I didn't really learn it until I got into graduate school. I mean, even as a major, even as a, a biology science student in college, I was not taught that questions were important. I was just taught to learn this crap in the textbook and do well on the exam. When I got to graduate school, I suddenly realized nobody cared what I knew. They wanted to know what I wanted to know. That became the important thing. So I think that's when I first began to realize it. And, and I feel bad that so many people can go through a whole college education and never realize that the important thing in life is to ask a good question. 
Yes, because actually we get punished on school yeah. when we ask a question. Yeah, or at least when we pretend, when we claim we don't know. I mean, you take a test and there's a yes or a no answer. It's right or wrong and you get a number, it's a grade. That's terrible, you know. Only we can figure out how to give a multiple choice question that doesn't have multiple answers, right? I mean, when is that the case in the real world? But, and you are saying that it. actually... Oh, when we have a multiple choice of four questions, actually, uh, and the four answers are wrong. Yes, yes. So <laughs> it's, it's kind of crazy. So right? you make people perception that there is some kind of truth. Yeah, yeah. When you give. But there is, you know, science is not after truth with a capital T. I mean, we, we are after the idea of things being true, but not with a big capital T, final truth final solution and ultimate truth. We just go from sort of being less wrong to less wrong, you know? I mean, you could say... Or more wrong. <laughs> well, sometimes more <laughs> wrong. But so, you know, people believe that one time that the earth, that the sun went around the earth, right? And that's wrong. But then, you know, Copernicus comes along and Galileo and they say, well, no, the earth and the other planets go make circular orbits around the sun. But that's actually wrong, right? So some years later, Kepler comes along and says, no, they're not circles, they're elliptical orbits, right? They make an oval orbit, not a perfect circle. That turns out to be a critical piece of information that nobody understood. But Why? Well, because the circle was considered the perfect shape and that would be the way to do things. But, but when you looked at circles and you tried to calculate where the planets would be, you always needed to do a fudge factor of some sort. People put up with it because they thought, well, it's just a bad measurement on our part because everything is a circle. That's a perfect shape. The Greeks believed it was a perfect shape. Many, there are many historical examples of the circle being this perfect idea. And, um, but, but, but it's also true that circles are less wrong than the sun going around the earth, right? So, so even though circles is wrong, it's less wrong than the first thing, even though ellipsis mm -hmm. is a little bit righter. So we just go from being less wrong to less wrong than that uh, in science. I think that's the idea, is to be less wrong about things, not right. Yes, very important. Yeah. And when I understood that, it was like, oh, wow, actually scientists don't know, they don't know everything. So <laughs> like me, I mean, it, it yes, was, yes. It, it's, join it's, the club. It's, it's, uh, um, you can't understand how important th that moment was in my life. I consider like we say, I'll be, be BC and like, I, yeah, yeah. I see uh, when I understood that actually nobody knows anything, that was the start of my life. <laughs> it's a, well, such a big thing to understand. Yes. Then, then you are comfortable that you can do yes, stuff. Yes, that's right. That's right. So uh, I just put a slide. It's not that nobody knows anything. I mean, we know things, <laughs> but none of them are written in stone, right? So first of all, there's many things we just don't know. Really, we know so much. Well, there's so much more we don't know than we do know. We know a lot, but there's a lot more that we don't know. And then everything we do know is up for grabs. It can be revised, it can be changed. So in that sense, we don't know anything. We don't know anything permanently. It's a process, it's dynamic. I think that's beautiful, I love that about it. If it was all just chiseled away in stone, so who cares then? Put the stones over there and let me get to the yeah, bar. Yeah, it's boring, as, you, yeah. as we said before. It's not, <laughs> yes. it's not a game that is difficult. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, so, so that's what's that? Made. So you are old. What brings you, you. <laughs> joy in life now? Ah, well, I, you know, first of all, I don't feel old, <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and I'm happy that I, I mean, I do feel old when I get up in the morning and I go, oh my God, <laughs> oh. That's, but after I loosen up a little bit, I don't feel so old. Um, and you know, inside you, feel a different age than what you, so I just don't look in the mirror anymore. That way I don't have to be surprised by what I see compared to what I feel like. This is one of the worst things about Zoom calling during the pandemic for me. You know, all of a sudden in the conversation you're having with people, you see yourself talking. And my view of myself talking, like I have with you now is, well, I'm a very handsome, charming guy, right? <laughs> very, you know. But then I look at myself on Zoom and I go, oh my God, look at that old wreck. What is he doing? There? It was terrible. I hate Zoom. <laughs> don't like to see myself that. So anyway, what gives me joy now? Well, I still 
I mean, I still love science because it's about the unknown, and I still love the fact that there's stuff to do. I, I, one of the great joys of being in science as a profession is that I get to work with people who are a generation or two behind me. So, you know, the lab is full of graduate students who are in their 20s and 30s, and... Um, and that's great because I'm 74, right? To so get a many... good insight in the world that we are living now through them. No, no, <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I could ever understand a little bit. Yes, but but you know, yes. I mean, they help me out that way. But I, no, I think it's your world. It's a different world that people live in. As my generation is a different world. You could spend more than two hours with me on this conversation. You could spend two years with me. You still wouldn't know what my world you know, at my age was about. Because it's a different history and all the rest of that. No, I think, I think you are right? wrong. When you spend some time with uh, well, one person, person. You, you get to understand a bit. Yes. The, you, oh, you're like, oh, he doesn't uh, watch TikTok and he reads the newspaper. <laughs> so that's <laughs> all right. But, but that's you would have something that. for, and that's an information today. It's information, but, but you say it as if you're amazed. What? He doesn't watch TikTok, he reads the newspaper. Oh, what? <laughs> so it's still beyond your understanding that that's the way somebody could live, right? Okay. You see it as a case. Yes, that's true. I don't watch TikTok, and believe it or not, I do read the newspaper. Although I will say I read it online. I don't actually open a newspaper anymore. But but yes, I know that seems crazy. I guess, but um, but so I enjoy being with with you know younger people and listening to their ideas and and things like that. Yes, and and the fact that they'll accept me in the conversation. Is very, is very nice. You know? So how do you think about like death, your legacy, what you want to leave behind? Hey. Are you afraid? Death. Well, I don't, I'm not looking forward to death, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not particularly, I would say, afraid of it in the sense of, you know, I, 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 I don't have any particularly strong religious beliefs, so I don't believe in an actual afterlife of some sort for a soul or anything like that. I think when I'm dead... So you are a be, physicalist? I, well, I guess. I'm not sure. That I, <laughs> yes, I mean, I believe in the kind of here and now in that sense. And, and my feeling about death is it'll probably be just like it was before I was born, which I have no experience of. And I don't think I'll have any experience of death either, except the moment of dying. But once you're dead, I think you're dead. Do I have a feeling about it? What a cool I, moment that would be. Huh? Well, I guess. If you only get to do it once and then you can't tell anybody about it, right? Which is really boring, right? So Yes, because sharing is the fun yeah, part yeah. of life. So, so I'm not looking forward to it because I'm enjoying this life. I mean, maybe at some point I'll get some terrible illness, I'll be miserable, and I'll be happy to escape. I hope not. But for the moment, I'm certainly enjoying you know, life. And so why not keep it going as long as one can, it seems to me. Uh, reasonably. Um, a legacy, I don't know, legacies are tricky. First of all, one of the things about being dead is you lose control. So I don't, it's hard to know what a legacy will be. I always feel that that for me, I don't want this to sound like too much bullshit, but for me, my, my idea of an afterlife are the students who have come through my laboratory, people who I've affected and who will carry this on for generations afterwards. These are the people that, this is what matters in the end. It's not what I've done, it's what they'll do and what their students will do and so forth. Because that's the way the world goes. You know, you have to believe in a world that goes on, I hope, for a while. So can you understand this? Uh, I'm not sure if you do, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm a guy from a, a small country in Europe that I speak Greek. And I read your books, I watch your talks, uh, another podcast that you did. And probably you had same influence like to me like you had to some of your students do you understand this well i'm amazed by it i mean i think it's remarkable it, it is a, it is amazing to me i and i and i'm gratified by it i mean i like this um you know this ted talk if you go on the ted somebody called me about well, now it's about a month or so ago i guess one of my colleagues wrote to me actually wrote an email to me and said you know i wanted to give your uh, the the URL for your TED Talk to a colleague. So I looked it up. He said, do you know that you have 3 million views on this TED Talk? 
<laughs> I don't look at it anymore. So I didn't know. And I couldn't believe that. Three mo- I mean, if I write a paper, a science paper or something, I'm happy if 10 or 12 people read it, you know? Maybe somebody cites it. Uh, maybe 20 people read it. But that's about it. But 3 million, I can't even really imagine what that means. And, and if it has an effect on people in some way, I mean, that's wonderful. I, I learned after I uh, wrote the book, which was an accident, writing the book to begin with. But after I wrote the book, I was on a couple of radio shows to promote it. You know, the publisher gets you on shows. And it was my wife who pointed this out, actually. I was on one of these radio talk shows on NPR. And then they took call-ins, questions. And after the show was, and I was just busy answering the question, of course, but after the show was over, I walked out. My wife was there. She'd been listening to it. She said, do you realize that about half the callers were high school science teachers who found this really important, these ideas important and all that. And I didn't recognize that. And I didn't write the book for high school science teachers. I just wrote it for people in general. But I've been very gratified by that. And now I spend a lot of time with high school science teachers and high school students because I realize the book speaks to them in some way that I think is really important at that young age. So that's very gratifying and completely unexpected. So you never... You can't know these things in advance, you know, where it will reach or whatever. One of the nice things about writing the book I've learned is that I get invited to do things like this. And now I'm talking to an audience who I would never have the opportunity to talk to if all I was was a scientist doing olfaction probably, right? And now I get to talk to people of all sorts. I have no idea who your audience is, but I imagine they're very diverse and they have all kinds of ideas. And maybe one thing I say will click with it maybe not i don't know but it maybe one thing does hopefully it raise good questions yeah <laughs> yes hopefully that's right i mean you know what is a good idea worth i think it's worth a tremendous amount you know people always say to me well i don't spend money on going to conferences because they're expensive and this and that and i think to them really i i go to every conference I can because i get to talk to people i hear what other people are thinking and maybe i get one good idea So it cost me $5,000. Isn't that worth a good idea? I would pay twice that, three times that. I I agree, especially in my case, which is like a business uh, Mm -hmm. that I'm running. And one idea can, I I see directly can yield like, for example, your idea about ignorance. Oh yeah, Yeah, yeah. so it's uh, YouTube videos we don't, it's not that we figured it out, it's by making mistakes and understanding better about the and so that idea can yield to me like millions of dollars and it's like and if it will not lead to me it might lead to a better quality of life or a better conversation any of those things right and you would have had no idea that this idea was going to hit you in the head one day right so you don't know you know just when you least expect it the unexpected all happens as they say so uh, you don't know where the next good idea will come from you overhear a conversation or you go to a talk or you watch a movie and suddenly something pops in your head it's a mystery but it's a so, wonderful mystery so i I, th- I always in my life i wanted to discuss this topic with one person that uh about because what i'm doing here my job is to ask good questions yeah. please i want to spend more time on this topic how okay. how do we uh, how do I go about that? How do I, I'm improving about asking better questions? How how I'm doing? Uh, well, you're doing pretty well today, I think. I don't know. It's hard to know because we'll see when we look at it. It right? depends on what on the, them, right? On them. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's hard to know. I think you, you um, as I said, I think a good question because, leads places. Uh, uh, because in my opinion, it's not only the question, also is the energy that you ask yeah, the yeah. question is like yeah so there is a lot more things to this topic that yeah so i mean so one thing is your question is a genuine question it's something you really want to know now that may not always be the case for someone like you you have a podcast you have to think of well what might my audience want to know and i don't really care about this or i already know this but i want him to say this or her if it's a woman in the you know so i'm going to ask this question because i want them to say it even though i know the answer so that's one way of doing it because you think it's an important question for other people to hear about okay otherwise i think it's a question that you care about so you ask that or you start a question and you hope that it leads someplace you hope that the person you ask the question of has a an answer that makes you think of another question 
and you trust yourself. I mean, you, you're a curious person, so you have to have a certain confidence that if you listen, more questions will come up, and we'll have a conversation, and it will go on, you know? So confidence is a... I think it has a lot to do with it, yes. I don't know how to tell you to do that. I have no secret formula for confidence, but I think so, yes. Uh, so one part which of... comes from curiosity, actually, and, and a trust in your curiosity. That what you don't know is interesting to other people also. So one part of your book, uh, that's why I'm mentioning this again, you said about, oh, how do you, if you had a conversation with Einstein, it was, uh, in, it's not, you don't ask him like, oh, describe me how MC square or whatever right, right, the right. thing is. He's like, you ask him like more interesting questions, ah, oh, but how, how did you exactly find that thing? And like how, whatever, what is yes. the the daily thing that what it led after you found it how whatever all these questions that you can but like for example i had the opportunity to speak uh, with elon musk for 10 minutes uh -huh. well, that's so, a long time to speak to elon musk yes <laughs> his minute he the, he said that like, is valued three million dollars every oh, minute <laughs> so that was a lot of value for my, my time <laughs> so uh yes but like what uh, when you meet with all these uh clever people, individuals, like, what is, uh, what is the best way to engage with them well, to, you, you, to be resourceful and productive? I mean, you're asking me this question, but actually I think I should be asking you this question. You do this for a living, really, right? You meet with all these different people and you try and draw them out. Yes, but you, you are one of the, one right, of the I'm, person, I'm, so I'm reverse engineering. <laughs> what do you really want it? Uh, or what is that? What is interesting to you? So, I, I mean, don't you think, just from your experience too, don't you think this varies from person to person? I mean, I'm sure that there's some people... So, you know, I teach this class, right, called Ignorance. That's how this whole business started. I thought it would be interesting to have a class that was about what we don't know. Because you, you, and Columbia University allows you to... Yeah, uh, believe it to, or not. To do whatever <laughs> class you not want. Not whatever I want, but they passed this class. They, oh. I had to have it okayed. Okay. And, and actually, they thought it was a great idea. So, and, and it was. Um, because we, I thought we spent four years jamming facts down their throats. So how many actual students you had on that class? So um, originally it was designed for 18 to 20 students. It was a small seminar class. But uh, one year, now we do everything online, enrollment and everything else. And one year, there's a box you have to check when you list your course online for people to enroll in it. And it says limited to 25 students or, or however many. And one year I forgot to check that box. And when I looked the next day after enrollment, I had 90 students registered for the class. So I thought, well, now what do I do? Uh, I can't just tell 70 students to get lost somehow or another. So I just thought, well, I'll try it for 90 students and see. And it actually worked better. So I now do it for about 90 to 100 students when, when I do the class. I haven't done it the last couple of years in the pandemic because it's not a Zoom class. It's a class you, I feel, have to do in person. But the class is very simple. It's two hours long. It meets once a week. And I invite a, a member of the faculty, some scientist from any field at all, chemistry, physics, mathematics, I don't care, geology, ecology, all of them. And they come in and I, all I ask them to do is to spend two hours talking with us about what you don't know. What's your question? Why did you choose this question? Why is this question better than that question? There are probably plenty of questions in your field. What attracts you to this question? What happens if you answer this question? Will you have another question? What if you never answer this question? All those sorts of things. And it's become, it's a very successful class because we just start the conversation and it goes. Now, in answer to your earlier question, what makes a good question? I do, what I've learned is that when I talk to these people and they come into the class, I do what you're doing now. I sort of interview them. I start with an interview and then the students join in with questions. We take questions from them. But, and I have about 10 questions that I have written down that I've thought, okay, I can have, if we run out of steam or something. But most of the time, we just start talking and one thing leads to another. So you are a podcaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not by intention, but I guess so. But yes, I think that's what happens, you know. I think that's, that's the dynamic. Now, 
there are people for whom it's very difficult. I, I have to say, I've had some, I won't name names, but one relatively famous scientist who's written several books and is well known for science communication. He was my most difficult because I would ask a question and he had a very clear, canned answer that he'd always used, you know, this is my, and he could talk in a whole paragraph. He was no ums and ahs. He just would talk in a paragraph and then he would be finished. And I'd go, oh, <laughs> and I have to ask my, and I almost ran out of questions because his answers didn't lead us to another question. They were just a complete and tidy so answer. Were, the worst interviewer, the worst interview you can have, right? So, and is that both of your problem? Uh, your problem of not asking the good questions and his problem of, no, of answering questions on well, a paragraph? Who, who, who has more problem on that? No, course? I think it's his problem. Well, I mean, it's my problem because I'm running the class and I'm going to run out of questions. But I think it's his problem for not thinking more widely, for being, not having the confidence to really say things about what he doesn't know, but to just answer, you know, these are the big so questions So he was not a physics. good person to put in an ignorance class. Not really. He was, <laughs> I mean, he was, I, I don't want to say it was awful or anything like that because it was okay. It, he, even that worked, but I would say he was the most difficult interview I had because his answers were too good. They were too pat, we say. They were too, too bad, not too good. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, somebody who sits there and goes, well, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it could be this way. Or I don't know. Maybe it could be that way too. That's more interesting. Then I say, well, what if we took this path? And then the problem is like, I, I went in heard a talk from a guy that won Nobel of uh, mathematics or something like that and like he was talking about it and usually the problem is on the other person when you don't understand so I think when I don't yeah. understand I think he's stupid yeah not me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> well that's often true I mean I, I think a lot of people and I think this is certainly true of scientists I worry about it because they don't communicate well and I think this comes from a, a kind of a, a sense of generosity, which I think you have. I'm not trying to compliment you here. I'm, I'm just speaking actually in, in sort of serious terms about what makes a, an interview good, is that the two people talking are generous and that they're not trying to cover anything up. They're not holding anything back. They just honestly want to communicate. And they want other people to be able to understand what they say. So they don't talk too fast and they don't Emp use big empathy words. Empathy to the people that they are. Yes, words. empathy would be the other word for it, yes. And so they're careful about that. You know, they don't, they don't rely on big words or let me prove how smart I am or any of those kinds of things, you know. They're willing to say, yeah, I, I, I don't have the slightest idea about that. So, but sometimes people have the... I, I met some people while doing this podcast that they are actually brilliant, but sometimes they can't help themselves because they have the cares of knowledge. When you know so many things yeah. or whatever, yeah. it's like, it's like you, because, and sometimes I have a problem, like, because I know so many things about YouTube and like how mm. a video, and like, when I start talking about, yeah, I use some terminologies and yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you gotta so, be careful, right? Yeah, about so, that. <laughs> so sometimes is the, uh, what do you think about the cares of knowledge? Well, yeah, I mean, the, it, Again, it depends on the individual. I mean, not everybody is going to be good at talking to other people or talking in public. So there are people who just can't speak in public. It's not such a big deal. Not everybody in the world should be an actor or a public speaker or a podcaster, right? I mean, it's a funny set of talents or abilities that you discover in yourself. You have it. You can practice them. You can get better at them. There's no question about that. But some people either have no interest in it whatsoever. Leave me alone. I'm in my laboratory. I just want to do my experiments and that's the end of it. I respect that. It's okay. It's one way of doing it. I'm a, I'm a very thoroughgoing pluralist. I really believe that there are many, many ways of doing the same thing, if you will. And they're all valid. You know, I, I like to tell this story. It's called the story of my dog. Not really, I have a dog, but it's not about my dog. It's just the story of my dog. And the story is a very simple story. It goes like this. Young Tom, who's in the seventh grade or something, is given an assignment to write an essay. So he hands in an essay called My Dog. Two days later, the teacher comes back to him and says, Tom, your essay on My Dog is exactly the same as your brother's was. <laughs> Did you copy it? And Tom says, well, no, ma'am. It's the same dog. <laughs> 
But we realize that's ridiculous, right? Just because it's the same dog doesn't mean it's, there's only one description of that dog. But in many things in life, we do think that. There's only one way to do it. There's never only one way to do it. And there's never only one good way to do it. There are many good ways to do it, and they can't all be done at once sometimes. But that's okay. That makes the world an interesting place. I'm young. I'm 22 now. Wow, really? You're so younger than I thought. What, what, what advice do you have for people going in this life at 18, 19, 20, uh, and, and then after when you answer that, I want to ask you, about love, what do you think about oh. love? <laughs> <laughs> so you've asked me about two questions that I know nothing whatsoever about. That's very good. Um, <laughs> it looks like we're coming to the end here. <laughs> um, advice I, I try not to give. I mean, I will give advice to people about a specific issue if I know something about it. Should I apply here or should I go there? Here are my two choices, which would you do? Or I'm going to give a talk. I think I should emphasize this or this. If I have some experience that I think could be useful to them, I give advice. What advice would I give to you at 22 to do with the rest of your life? That would be a crazy thing to do. And you would be stupider if you listened to me if I were to give you that advice. So, and I don't think you would. I couldn't give myself advice. I think of myself at 22 and where I am now, and I could never have predicted that. It's impossible to predict. I can see, I can look back and see all the steps that were taken that made sense. Oh, well, I did this then, I did that then, and yes, I understand why that decision was made, and here I am now. But if I were back there then, I could never have predicted when I was 22 that some 50 years later, I would be sitting here doing a podcast. What the frick is a podcast? <laughs> right? I mean, when I was 22, we didn't have podcasts, right? So what kind of advice could I possibly give? Okay, I, I love that answer. And now let's move on okay. to the other question that you don't know mm. about love. Do you believe in love? I mean, romantic love. Do you think uh, uh, you, you are married in your life? You have a child? Like, do you think that was time well invested? <laughs> <laughs> sure, because my wife might listen to this podcast. So. <laughs> um, Yes, of, of course it, it, it is. I mean, it's, it's probably not for everybody, and I can't say every minute of it has been just the most wonderful experience that I've ever had. In fact, I'll, I'll make an admission. My wife and I have actually been uh, married uh, twice, divorced and married three times to each other, not to different people. <laughs> So we've been married, divorced, married, divorced, and now we're married. Okay, again. I'm okay. more curious to hear your, your thoughts. So now. now you're going to ask me about love? Are you crazy? <laughs> so now you should know I have nothing to do. I have no idea about it. I can't even make a decision like that very well and stick with it. So, um, but I, there's nothing about it that I regret. I would say that's the only thing maybe you could say sensibly about it. I don't regret any of it. I, I can't. But I mean, you probably don't, don't regret anything in your life. Well, I try not to. So and, and I not think, regretting is yeah, not, maybe it's you're not right a good. That. It's not a good. Yeah, all right, you got me on that. I suppose. <laughs> I mean, I could imagine having had a completely different life in which I was never married, never had children, and I think I could have been perfectly happy with that as well. But this is the life that I had, and I'm I'm also quite happy with that, and I and I do believe in it. I mean, my wife and I met in very unusual circumstances. She actually picked me up hitchhiking. I was the hitchhiker. Oh, that's funny. She was the driver, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very chance meeting. Who knew that this so could happen? So what age you did hitchhiking? About 23 or 24. So and be careful. <laughs> wh where, where you did this hitchhiking? This was in Philadelphia. I okay. lived in Philadelphia And, and why at that time. you did hitchhiking? It was raining out a little bit, and I needed to get to this place I was going. It was just a couple blocks away. It was very short. And I also had seen my, I'd seen this woman come out of an apartment and get into a car. She's very attractive. And I thought, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was your way I of... I stuck my thumb out. I never thought she would pick me up. Honestly, I thought she's just going to go right on by this pervert, right? But, but she stopped, and she opened the door and said, yeah, get in. And it turned out she was a set designer. I was then a theater director. And she, I didn't know this, was a set designer working somewhere else. She was in another area of the city working in a completely different area. So we didn't know each other before this, even though we actually worked in the same business, as it were, at the time. So it was curious, that kind of meeting. And, um, yeah, I would say, you know, 
I don't know what to call love and what not to call love. I mean, there's, you know, there's sexual love, there's romantic love. They often are the same. They're not always the same. Um, there's, you know, the love of a child, the love now I have a grandchild who's, you know, nothing but a bundle of, I don't know, a little thing. She's two months old today. She has 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's the only thing I can tell you about her <laughs> because the rest of it is completely unknown. But I love her deeply, you know. If it was a choice between me and her today, it would be her. I'm, I'd check out, you know. I can't explain why that's the case. There's, you know, but there it is. You know, we're, we're, we do this. <laughs> So, I, I I have more questions, but okay. we run out of time oh, because you need to go see you, my you granddaughter. Need to go and see your granddaughter <laughs> yes. now. So yes. I want to say that uh, it was pure joy. Well, I had the for greatest me time to sit here and hear you in person answer my questions. I love you, and yes, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys. I agree. Thank you guys for watching, if that's the right way to sign up. This has been a pleasure. Went by like zip.